We're just a few weeks away from the launch of my new supplement line, Adapt Naturals. We're starting with a daily stack of five products called the Core Plus Bundle, which are designed to add back in what the modern world has crowded out and help you feel and perform your best. I wanted to give you a quick sneak peek into one of the products in the bundle, BioVail Organ. If you follow my work for any length of time, you won't be surprised that I'm including an organ supplement in our initial stack. Organ meats are among the most nutrient-dense foods we can eat. In fact, a recent study found that four of the seven most nutrient-dense foods were organs, liver, spleen, kidney, and heart. I've recommended eating organ meats for years, but they have a strong flavor and texture that isn't familiar to those of us that didn't grow up eating them, so most people are missing out on the incredible health benefits of organs and offal. That's why I created BioVail Organ. It contains a blend of five freeze-dried organs, liver, heart, kidney, pancreas, and spleen, sourced from 100% grass-fed, grass-finished, free-range New Zealand cattle. Taking BioVail Organ daily is equivalent to eating about four ounces of nutrient-dense organ meat a week, exactly in line with what I recommend. BioVail Organ is sourced from animals that are never given antibiotics, growth hormones, or stimulants, and it's free of artificial flavors, colors, or chemical preservatives. It'll be available exclusively in the Adapt Naturals Core Plus bundle, which you'll be able to order in just a few weeks. Stay tuned for more info between now and when we launch. Hey everybody, Chris Crosser here. Welcome to another episode of Revolution Health Radio. I've been interested in the use of psychedelics and empathogens for psychotherapeutic treatment for many years now. Um, if you've been listening to my show for some time, I've had a few different guests on to talk about that from different perspectives, including Michael Mithofer, who co-founded the MAPS organization, MDMA Assisted Psychotherapy, and is doing a lot of research on the application of MDMA for PTSD and other psychiatric and psychological conditions. And I've been really excited to see how research in this field is continuing to progress, not just with MDMA, but also with psilocybin, ketamine, and other compounds that have shown promise in supporting people with depression, anxiety, PTSD, and other conditions for which treatments, sometimes conventional treatments, uh, sometimes leave a lot to be desired. And you know, the, the psychedelics and empathogens seem to work in a fundamentally different way. And in some cases can lead to pretty dramatic improvements almost overnight. And these improvements are often long lasting. Uh, ketamine is a great example of this uh, for people with moderate to severe depression. I've seen ketamine literally reverse it overnight and I've seen those effects last over uh, a significant period of time. Now, none of these treatments are panaceas, and I think that's really important to point out. Whenever there's an exciting new development like this, uh, there's often a bandwagon effect, and I think sometimes the risk is that we can attribute uh, almost miraculous powers to these new treatments, and, and I, I don't uh, want to see that happen uh, in the case of psychedelics and pathogens because I, they, they do have so much potential when they're used properly. And they're not without risk. Uh, they're, I think, pitfalls, uh, especially when they're not used under supervision and or uh, when they're used improperly. And that's also a risk when there's so much interest in them and, and they're not easy to obtain because they're still illegal uh, in many cases in the U.S. and and in other countries, and so that leads to people getting them through back channels, and you know sometimes people aren't getting what they think they're getting, and, and that leads to a whole bunch of different risks altogether. So I, I'm really excited to welcome Dr. Ingmar Gorman as my guest today. He earned his doctorate in clinical psychology at the New School for Social Research and did his clinical training at Mount Sinai, Beth Israel Hospital, Columbia University, and Bellevue, and then he completed his NIH postdoctoral fellowship at New York University in 2017, and he served as the uh, co-principal investigator on phase two and phase three clinical trials of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, and he's also published on topics of uh, classic psychedelics, ketamine, MDMA, and psychedelic harm reduction and integration. So he has a lot of experience in this field, and he has is also now the co-founder and CEO of Fluence, a psychedelic therapy training company, which is geared towards training 
healthcare professionals on how to use psychedelics in their practice uh, for therapeutic purposes. So I really enjoyed this conversation. If you're interested in this topic, I think you will too. Let's dive in. Dr. Ingmar Gorman, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Pleasure to be here. So I'm curious about what got you interested in the field of psychedelics as, as they're applied in a psychotherapeutic context. Sure. So um, it's a long story, but the short version of it is that I was living in Prague in the Czech Republic, I'm half Czech and partly grew up there. And it was a combination of uh, exposure to uh, an expatriate community that was very interested in psychedelics, as well as um, a longstanding history of psychedelic research in the former Czechoslovakia. Uh, and as I began to do some research, look into some of the literature, uh, as well as some of my own personal experiences, uh, I realized that there really was a lot of overlooked potential to these compounds, potentially medications uh, that you know, they were studied in the 40s, 50s, 60s, early 70s, and then that research got shut down. And my thinking was, and I also I always like an underdog story. Well, why not um, contribute to some more science in psychedelics and see whether there really is this overlooked potential that could be helpful to many, many people uh, and their mental health. And so that was around 2004. And at that point, after about a year, I decided to uh, return to my undergraduate education and I dedicated my entire career to the topic of psychedelic therapy and science and got a PhD and here I am today. Fantastic. I'm looking forward to diving into that in more detail. I want to share a little bit about my experience on this topic, just for full disclosure. Whenever I talk about psychedelics or empathogens in a, in a clinical context, I, I like to just tell people a little bit about where I'm coming from as well. Um, like you, I have my own personal experience. I went to UC Berkeley as an undergrad and um, <laughs> not quite the same as it was in the 60s when my parents went there, but still definitely in uh, uh, the type of place where people are doing this, this kind of exploration. And I was fortunate to encounter a mentor who who really guided people who were interested in, in this on, to, on how to use psychedelics for therapeutic and, and even spiritual purposes. And so I was very fortunate to have exposure to somebody like that at an early age and, and explored, you know, various psychedelics and pathogens and, and plant compounds that had similar effects. And I feel like that was, those really opened a lot of doors for me and, and um, gave me insight and perspective that I wouldn't have had otherwise. I, I'm sure we'll come back to this. I do. I like to say that they, they opened the doors. They didn't take me through the door. I still had to do that work myself, but I'm tremendously grateful for the way the doors that they did open and the, the uh, things that they showed me. And, and so over time since then, I've gone in and out of using that uh, psychedelics for that same purpose, always with a, a growth orientation, you know, uh, not really for recreational purposes, but just for gaining insight and perspective and clarity and, and in ways that are, are more difficult um, to do as we just kind of inhabit our normal reality. And then as a clinician, I became really interested in their therapeutic potential for anxiety, depression, PTSD, I've had Michael Mithofer on the podcast, whom I'm sure you know well, uh, and, and several other people um, who are, you know, exploring this in different ways. And I've just seen the effects firsthand of depression, anxiety, PTSD, and other mental and behavioral health conditions. And I'm aware of how lacking some of the typical treatments are and how much people suffer from these conditions. And I've, I've seen pretty miraculous effects uh, in some cases with things like ketamine and people with moderate to severe depression that can be quite long lasting. And, you know, I, they're not a panacea. I'm sure we'll talk about that as well. But I'm just thrilled, actually, that that people like you are out there doing this research and, and advancing this field forward, because I think there's so much untapped potential. And I think these treatments are so much more humane and safe than a lot of the treatments that are currently already approved and out there and in widespread use. So 
really looking forward to diving in uh, further. Just wanted to give everybody a little bit more about uh, where I'm coming from here, so so that they know you know what my background is on this topic. So let let's start with a sort of brief summary, if that's even possible, of the current empirical evidence and clinical trials that have examined psychedelics for you know psychiatric conditions like depression etc like what how would you summarize the state of the research right now sure i was happy to do that and thank you for sharing that that background um i definitely found parallels in in my own story to, to yours uh but yeah hopefully we'll return to some of the things that you had mentioned sure so it's quite a lot to to summarize i'll say that in the first era of say modern psychedelic research, which was from perhaps the mid forties to uh, the mid seventies. Some of the indications that were studied included alcohol use disorder, we would call it today, anxiety related to end of life. But really there was in terms of smaller studies, uh, if you go through the literature that was published at that time, you can really find dozens of different ailments or indications that were studied using primarily LSD or psilocybin. MDMA, the uh, intactogen or empathogen that you uh, mentioned, was not uh, really rediscovered until the mid-1970s, so you didn't have so much research there. The kind of uh, the psychedelic renaissance, as sometimes people refer to it today, um, was really revitalized in the mid-2000s uh, and uh, began to pick up steam in the 2010s and now is kind of really moving forward with a lot, of, a lot of energy behind it. And what you'll notice is that some of the studies that are further along today uh, have kind of built upon the research that was conducted in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So again, anxiety related to end of life and alcohol use disorder, those studies were redesigned or the design of those protocols were, were updated. And you have studies today looking with, with initial results uh, that were promising with alcohol use disorders, um, smoking cessation, so nicotine use, uh, again, end-of-life anxiety, as I'd mentioned, but also uh, depression and treatment-resistant depression, also some early studies looking at uh, eating disorders, anxiety in people living with uh, autism spectrum disorder, um, I'm sure I'm leaving out some here. Well, PTSD, that is where we see the MDMA and the, uh, or the pathogen really being studied to treat PTSD. And that perhaps, that research sponsored by MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, which, for whom uh, Michael Midhofer has been a major uh, contributor, uh, that research is probably the furthest along. And, and maybe it's fair to say, just or quickly add that I'm not going to go through the whole FDA approval process unless <laughs> you would like me to, but maybe we could fo focus on two kinds of studies, phase two and phase three studies. Um, phase two studies are usually with uh, 20 participants. You have a compound, a, a drug, and you have a hypothesis that it's going to work with a particular disease. And so you're looking at small samples of 20 people, and perhaps you do several of these smaller studies, and you're looking for one for safety data, but also for a signal. Is there a signal here that this could potentially work for um, a small number of people? And then if you find that signal, then you scale up to what's called a phase three study, which is where you're looking at hundreds of people, again, looking for that signal. And I'll say that with the MDMA for PTSD research there, we are uh, actually potentially close to the end of phase three. So um, MAPS actually just about a few weeks ago, closed off recruitment for those studies, meaning that they believe that they now have the number that they need to submit to the FDA for review. Pretty much all other studies, all the other things I had mentioned are, say, uh, at the completion or the beginning of phase two, but have not moved to phase three yet. Maybe one last point that I'll add here is that after phase three, once those, those data are collected, submitted to the FDA, they can do a review. And at if all goes well, then that medicine or that compound can become a medicine. It can become a prescribable medicine. So again, MDMA for PTSD is furthest along. And if all goes well, we could, um, I have to be very careful about how I word this. <laughs> it's not definite, but there's a possibility 
that MDMA might become a medicine potentially in 2024. That's amazing. And quite a surprise in some ways, if you consider what you mentioned earlier, how the, the research climate was pretty hostile to these compounds um, not that long ago. So what changed there? And, and what are you seeing now in terms of the receptivity of you know, IRB boards and, and just the, the research community as, as a whole, the government, regulators, et cetera? Yeah, great question. So from kind of my time, what, what I've seen in the, in the near past and the present and the future, um, one really important study was the work of Rick Strassman, who was studying DMT, and in the 90s really went through all of the regulatory uh, paperwork and hurdles to get a, a study to look at the, um, a psychedelic in healthy humans, just to get that approval. And, and that, um, many people credit him as doing all the difficult labor to just get a study, for a study to be uh, just conducted. Another factor I would say is uh, the generation of people who are in some of these, in the FDA uh, or other kind of institutions where um, what I've been told is that they are now, sometimes some of the people who were um, more active in the 1960s and 70s, and now they're in positions of authority where they may have their own uh, perspective on the potential for these compounds. So there's a little bit of a shift in culture there. And now when we're talking about the present moment, uh, that was maybe the 90s and 2000s, but now there really is one, I think, a recognition that in mental health, the medications that we have currently are really not addressing the large mental health crisis. It's not to say that uh, current medications don't work. They, they do work for some people, but it's not, I think, agreed upon that's not enough of a solution to address um, the scale that we're looking at. And then another element of it is also um, just financial interest, just to be, to be blunt, right? That there's a, a lot of potential uh, money to be made by uh, identifying new psychedelic compounds that don't even exist yet that can be patented. Um, and also to, for, to find solutions, right? Because if you could address depression uh, or anxiety in the United States or globally, there are so many people that suffer from this, as you had mentioned earlier, that um, there is also money to be to be made there. Yeah, the economic burden of depression alone worldwide is in the hundreds of billions of dollars, um, if not trillions of dollars. And I agree. I mean, I, just from my outside perspective, looking in, it seems like there's a the gestalt around psychedelics has changed. And there's a sort of like, um, snowball phenomenon where you get some studies approved that that adds legitimacy. Then you get you know people in Silicon Valley microdosing and talking about their microdosing on podcasts, and then you get a new startup that somehow raises millions of dollars and is valued at a billion dollars. That's you know related to psychedelics, and all of a sudden something that was relatively fringe and verboten really to talk about publicly in the past is is sanctioned um, through all of these different avenues whether they're you know actually governmental and regulatory or whether it's um, you know Silicon Valley and venture capital coming in to add their stamp of legitimacy so it does seem to me that there's been a sea change for sure it's and it's been so rapid it's a little bit of a whiplash in the last i would say three years um you know as i was listening to you one thing i want to also add in terms of what uh, a variable that might have contributed to this change i think we really need to give credit to uh the scientists uh who in the uh you know 2006 2008 that kind of period were doing very um how would you say, like strict and sometimes even conservative science around psychedelics. Um, I'm thinking about particularly uh, the group from Johns Hopkins, uh, Roland Griffiths, Matthew Johnson, um, and others there, as well as uh, teams at New York University, who really, so Stephen, Stephen Ross and Jeff Gus, Tony Bossis, um, and uh, others who did not get too caught up in the like over exuberance about these compounds and really paid a lot of attention to strict clinical research design uh, so that um, when they were questioned, 
about the legitimacy of the science, they were prepared with the, the data and the, um, again, the kind of approach so that they would be taken seriously. Yeah, it's so important to do that, especially early on, and especially with compounds that already have a stigma uh, surrounding them. So yeah, I think that's a great point. So let's, let's talk a little bit about um, some current theories on why psychedelics are effective. And, you know, maybe we can focus on PTSD, because there's more research on that with MDMA than anything else. But you know, what are some thoughts on what's actually happening there in terms of the neurochemical biological changes and 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 then you know by extension what are what is mdma doing for people with ptsd that other current treatments are not able to do yeah this is a great question i could really talk about this for multiple, several hours <laughs> so We're probably gonna have to have you back so okay. we'll, we'll just do a sort of brief summary because i think for this show i just want to give people a kind of overview of everything that's happening in the space and then we can have you back to drill down on specific topics sure sure well so the way that i like to answer this question is to maybe so so first it's important to say that there's more money coming in to do this research but for a large portion of time it was really based off of donation uh and fundraising and whether it's donations or the relations or not, clinical research at this phase is really, you're going to get your best bang for the buck, so to speak, to evaluate whether something works or not, not how does it work, right? right. And so we don't really know exactly how these uh, treatments might work, but we have hypotheses. One way that I like to break that down could be kind of a, a passive process where there's, let's say, just to your to your question, there's just a biological effect. And so if we're talking about MDMA and PTSD, um, well, one, we have a release of serotonin. There's also oxytocin and prolactin. You have a dopamine release as well, um, some cortisol release. So I'm not a neuroscientist, but to say that there are many uh, neurochemicals that are associated with the ingestion of, of MDMA. So how might this be helpful when it comes to PTSD? Well, one thing that we observe in brain scans is that there is a reduction in activity in the amygdala. The amygdala is a place in the brain that is processing uh, fear. And we know that in people who are living with PTSD, there's overactivation in the amygdala. So one hypothesis might be pure biological mechanism here. We're having uh, some maybe return to normal in terms of the, the amygdala function. But we also know that when we talk about psychedelic therapy or MDMA therapy specifically, it's a combination of the drug effect and the psychotherapeutic or psychological experience. So here we could look at maybe a combination of what's going on biologically in the, in the participant or patient and also the therapy that's happening in the room. So for example, oxytocin, prolactin, that's a bonding hormone it's associated with uh, potentially a greater sense of, of trust. And when we look at people who are living with PTSD, often there's also some sort of interpersonal uh, violation that has happened there. And uh, it's very difficult for them to establish trust, particularly very quickly, like we, we see in uh, the studies where we're talking really about a three-month treatment. So there might be some facilitation of the therapeutic relationship between the therapist and this effect uh, through oxytocin. Um, I, could go, I could go on. I mean, we could talk about serotonin and mood. We can talk about dopamine and the ability to focus and learn. Um, but so it's, there's really a, a likely synergistic effect between a lot of these different neurotransmitters and, and, and healing. But then there's also another approach here or factor that may not be sort of purely biologically mechanical in nature, <laughs> like the like pure neurotransmission. But we can also think about how the therapy is designed in MDMA-assisted uh, psychotherapy for PTSD that might contribute to a person getting better. So one of the fundamental tenets in this work, and really across different psychedelic therapies, is this notion of trusting the, uh, the participants or, or patients intuition around their growth process. And so 
it's not like we, we don't give people MDMA and then as the therapist say, okay, this is everything that you're doing wrong in your life. And this is what you need to do better. And, you know, isn't it terrible that you're drinking? And you know, <laughs> no, it's, it's the opposite. What we do is we create an environment and a set and setting that allows for the, the participant to sort of be their own guide. We give them the space uh, and time to journey inward, to speak metaphorically, and begin to identify the kinds of things that will help themselves get better. And I think that that's partly why these um, studies are so impactful, because the it's even hard to speak of the, say the word solution, but it's sort of the path is not uh, dictated by somebody externally, but is really coming from within the person undergoing the experience. Mm -hmm. And this resonates with me because, um, you know, one, one of the things I've done over the years, we have a health coach training program and health coaching is really based in a similar methodology and approach where we recognize the wholeness of, of the client and uh, it embraces a, a more of a positive psychology um, frame where each person is fundamentally whole and well, and it's up to the coach to help them to discover their own strategies and motivations for change. And uh, rather than starting from the place of you're broken, you need to be fixed. And me as the outside, the clinician, the authority, the therapist, whatever, I'm going to fix you essentially, which is kind of the conventional, uh, method. So I love that. And I, I think that's just, again, from my own personal experience, I, I, that, that resonates as true for me. I, I have a theory of my own. that's not tested. Not, it's not based on mechanics. I'd love your take on no, I'd love to hear it. I think that when people are dealing with severe depression, which I have dealt with at, at you know, I, I had a very severe chronic illness that led to a very severe depression for a period of time. And also people with PTSD, what can happen is we begin to identify as being depressed. I'm a person that is depressed. Depression is my reality. This is what I experience every time I wake up and it's the last thing I experience before I go to bed. And that gets enmeshed where I, can, I, don't, I, I no longer can experience myself in any other way than as someone who is depressed or who has PTSD. And what psychedelics do, whether it's MDMA or psilocybin, is they allow us to disidentify with that conception of ourselves and experience ourselves in a fundamentally different way, often completely free of whatever has plagued us 24 seven for months or years or even decades. And what that does is it creates hope. It allows us to even conceive of the possibility that we could be free of this depression or this trauma or whatever it is that's been so difficult for us. And just that hope makes all kinds of things possible that we're not possible before. So I'm curious, what do you think of that? Yeah, no, I know. I actually could not agree more. I, I um, think that this is definitely one of the elements of what that contributes to, to people getting better. And it can be quite astonishing. I mean, uh, I have direct experience in these clinical trials with a participant saying something like, um, well, just being astonished at the fact that they aren't uh, breaking down when recalling a certain memory. You know, it's not, it's not a, a blissful state. It's not an ecstatic state or a mystical state. It's simply the experience of being able to recall certain events from the past and not be completely dissociated or completely overwhelmed by that. And that little window of, um, or maybe not so little, I mean, for, for, for them, uh, just a, a moment, although it lasted several hours, but even the, a moment is such a significant event for them, mm -hmm. considering, like you've said, how many decades they may be living with this. And, and I do think that it, it allows them to, to reorient to their own self-concept. And so one thing that uh, we do at Fluence, uh, which I can, I can speak to, to later, um, when we advise different pharmaceutical companies that are looking to study psychedelics, uh, one thing that really pay attention to is actually this element. And we bring in a fair amount of, of mindfulness, either to the treatment or to the training of the therapists, so that they 
can help the participant be aware of these subtle shifts because sometimes it's dramatic, but sometimes it's, it's very, very subtle, the kind of orientation a person has to their own experience. And I think that that's what you're talking about. Right. And we will talk about the uh, fluence and what you're doing there and, and, and particularly this piece around how the context has to shift too. We're not just talking about, hey, let's switch out SSRIs for psilocybin and MDMA and just you know write a prescription, hand them to the patient and say, good luck, we'll see you in a few months. That's obviously not how this is, is supposed to work. And so um, I'm curious to hear how you're approaching that with fluence and we'll, we'll come back to that. But I, I would like to linger on this for a little while longer if you're willing to. Oh, absolutely. I, it's it's fascinating to me personally, and I think it's it really gets at the heart of what these medicines have to offer people. I've been a huge fan of Thrive Market since they launched eight years ago. I love having my favorite healthy product shipped right to my door at a fraction of the price I'd pay elsewhere. I use Thrive to order not only pantry staples like coconut milk, dark chocolate, and collagen peptides, but also toxin-free personal and household products. Thrive makes it really easy to find what you're looking for, whether that's paleo, low-carb or keto, or gluten-free. You can filter by more than 90 values and lifestyles to find what works for you. I also love Thrive's values as a company. They offer carbon-neutral shipping, and when you become a Thrive member, you sponsor a family in need. Join Thrive Market today and get $80 in free groceries. That's T-H-R-I-V-E Market dot com slash revolution health all one word to get eighty dollars in free groceries that's thrivemarket.com slash revolution health another thing that has struck me about these medicines is that many people who are severely depressed who have ptsd who have other types of uh, conditions that are being treated or at least explored or investigated in the context of, of psilocybin and MDMA, there's a lot of guilt and blame and shame um, that, that goes along with that. Like there's something I wrong with me because I'm severely depressed. There's something wrong with me that I can't get over this trauma. There's something wrong with me that I constantly feel anxious. And again, you know, going back to what I said before, like that, that leads to a sort of identification and a, and a, a sense of, of being broken and having the experience, once again, like you said, of being able to think about a certain issue that has always in the past overwhelmed me or has always caused me to just check out and shut down and being able to like be with that myself and that experience with compassion and empathy and w without the blame and the guilt, I think what that does for people is it flips a switch where before they thought there was, there must just be something wrong with their brain and how it works. And now they understand like, oh wait, yeah, there is actually something that's not working well, but it can change. Mm -hmm. And this is, can be this is, this is the most direct evidence you could possibly have right, right. that it can be different <laughs> because you're experiencing it as being totally different. And it didn't take five years of a certain process or supplement or a medication or therapy. It was literally like that, that it mm -hmm. changed. And knowing that the brain can change that quickly mm -hmm. and shift that quickly, albeit with the help of a, of a substance or a compound, I think also is tremendously liberating for people and it gives them a lot of compassion for themselves that they may not have had before. That's right. That's right. And you know, I think I'm always hesitant to stand behind just one explanation because I've seen so many different experiences and pathways that have led people to, to change and get better. I will say that, um, you know, if anything, what a psychedelic can do is create a pretty dramatic shift in consciousness, meaning a, a dramatic shift in the way that a person experiences the world. And regardless of the content of that, that shift, it is a shift. And so to speak to what you're saying, it's that going from existing in the world, thinking that I, my identity is a certain way and that the world is fixed in a certain way. And just having that temporary shift, although quite um, extreme and acute, 
it allows a person to say, huh, like, well, maybe everything isn't so set in stone as I thought. To build on to what, on what you've said here, so there's almost like a relationship to impermanence, if, if you will. Um, to build on to what you've, you said, though, sometimes it's not um, a, a cure. Sometimes symptoms come back. Sometimes people struggle in new ways. Um, so for example, what I've seen a fair amount with PTSD and other sort of more, uh, when, when the mental health issue is intractable and then there's uh, an improvement, people have a mourning period, a mourning period around the periods of their life that they've lost, um, relationships or opportunities. And so it's, you know, in contrast to some of the other existing medications, I think you were asking this question, we, we have this phrase in the psychedelic world of um, healing being nonlinear, or sometimes things get worse before they get better. And that's this notion that we're really in these treatments often bringing things to the surface. Uh, and perhaps we're getting more at the root cause of some of these um, issues, but that can also be a painful experience unto itself. And that's why the therapeutic process or support if it's not psychotherapy, then at least having a community to help people change through this this uh, this process, because it's not as simple as the things that are troubling you going away. Um, they can often transform into other things, uh, or there can be new challenges that arise. And um, it's important to see that as part of a process and not a negative side effect of a drug. And that's also where the stigma can, can come back in or self sort of incrimination. Oh, I'll, I'll never be healed. I'll never get better. This is who I am. The sort of narrative that a person creates around their experience uh, can, I think, have a pretty dramatic effect on them getting better. That's such an important point because the stories we tell have power and meaning as human beings, right? That's something that's, that's, that's hardwired into our DNA um, and has, has been a part of our history for millennia. And uh, that goes back to, I think, what we touched on with context, you know, mm. um, taking a, a psycho, uh, one of these substances in, for example, in a very sterile environment with, you know, clinicians with lab coats, white lab coats and clipboards and stuff like that is, is going to be a fundamentally different experience than taking it in a context where you have a warm, supportive guide who is, has experience, uh, you know, facilitating this, these kinds of journeys for people and can help the patient understand what they're going through in a growth mindset basically, mm -hmm. um, to use a, a psychological term. And I, I guess this gets at a couple of questions I wanted to ask you. You know, we've, we've really focused so far on the incredible potential and benefits of these compounds. What are some of the pitfalls that you see as these medicines gain popularity and exposure? You know, and I'm thinking of things like people taking them without this, that context, supportive context and, and way of understanding them, uh, people sourcing them off the, for lack of a better term, black market, uh, not really knowing what they're getting, and even you know people having experiences that they don't know how to integrate because mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't have that support or those tools, whether formally with a therapist who's experienced in this world or, or informally through their own community. Yeah, that's, I think you've, you've named um, some of the, the risks that can be there. Um, I think from a policy perspective in the United States, uh, I think we need to really pay attention to harm reduction, um, sort of decriminalization efforts, potentially legalization, uh, not from the perspective of um, medicine. I think that when we're calling something a medicine, it needs to go through the correct regulatory processes to identify, um, again, safety uh, and all the correct protocols so that people aren't uh, harmed in a medical context. But when it comes to people choosing to use a psychedelic outside of a medical context, I wish that we uh, had better policies to 
support safety. And I think we can look at other countries like the Czech Republic or, or Portugal, where the, there's sort of a disincentive to um, engage in harmful practices when it comes to the, the black market. I think taking a step back though, in terms of some of the concerns that I'm, I, I have, yeah, it's quite, quite complex. I think that there is right now a little bit of a, um, there's quite a lot of excitement when it comes to psychedelics as medicines. And it's unlikely that, it's, well, it's not a panacea, right? And so right now we're really testing out what works and what doesn't work. And we don't really know yet. And I think that because there's a lot of media attention on the topic, and there's a lot of also desperation from people in the public to get help, um, they may be willing to take greater risks um, around using a psychedelic for whatever they're struggling with. What about just the, the, the difference between the purity of various substances like MDMA uh, that somebody might obtain just buying it through a random person that they, they heard about, yeah. you know, that often can contain MDA, which is a different compound or speak, you know, various types of stimulants. And, you know, are you concerned about that with the growing attention uh, on these compounds? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I do. And I think, you know, there are a test kits that people can purchase legally online to, to just test what um, the, the drug that they've purchased contain. I think that, that, that is um, something that I'm concerned about, but I think, one thing that I'm concerned about that, another thing that I'm concerned about is a little bit, um, this is why I'm happy to have this conversation with you and recognize that you um, don't necessarily see psychedelics as a panacea because when people read the media reports that translates the science to the popular press, um, often there can be kind of focus on uh, all of the kind of the miraculous recovery, but not so much on the story of the journey that a person had to go through from the beginning of the treatment to the end of treatment. And I had mentioned before that it's not just like an elimination of a symptom. It really is a change process. I mean, you talked about, you know, you have to step through the door, right? It maybe opens a door. I like to say that what psychedelics can do is perhaps make change easier, but it's still up to you to make that change. Um, and one of my concerns is that there's going to be a story that people have in their mind from what they've consumed in the mass media. And then uh, when, if and when psychedelics become a prescribable medicine, uh, some degree of backlash or shock that it's not as how people had imagined that the actual story is a lot more complicated. And then I'm concerned that that gets blamed on the drugs right. <laughs> rather yeah. than on the change process. Right. I think there's an analogy here that just popped into my head that might be useful, which is, you know, we grew up watching very romanticized ideas of, of love, you know, in movies like this is you, you fall in love and you, you, you know, ride off into the sunset and everything is peachy and rosy from there. And I think that does a disservice to, to people because when they get into a real relationship with a real person, and start having challenges, then what can often happen is, oh, this is the wrong person for me. This is the wrong relationship. And now I'm just gonna drop this and move on to the next one. And that process can happen forever. I mean, I know people who are in their 50s and 60s and who are, who are still doing that because they still have this very romanticized ideal of what a loving relationship looks like and feels like and they miss the opportunity the growth opportunity that those conflicts and challenges can have when you really open up to using relationship as a as a mirror you know for seeing the places where we're stuck and we need to grow and develop on our own i feel like there's a similar risk there with psychedelics absolutely i think that's spot on i mean and just to build off of that analogy the relationships are also about loving relationships also involve compromise and I think that that is also something that it takes place in the, in the psychedelic journey as well um, around what a person can change in their life and maybe what they can't uh, coming acceptance. Right? That's also yeah. a piece of piece of love too, compassion. Absolutely. Yeah. If when we recognize that we're not in full control mm. 
over our own experience. You know, there there's varying degrees of control that we have in various situations, but recognizing that there are some things that um, influenced our our health, our well-being, our psychological development, the way we inhabit ourselves, that really actually had nothing to, to do with us, you know, that we're outside of our own volition that happened when we were at a very early stage in our lives, um, even right surrounding the birth process. Uh, we know there's a lot of research showing that things that happen during the birth process can have lifelong effects uh, psychologically. And and yeah, I think just the the compassion that comes from being able to to see that and experience that and accept that, like this is just part of my makeup in the same way that I have brown hair and blue eyes, and this is my kind of body type. Um, but I, I think there's a as a persistent idea that, um, and this is I think a razor's edge because mm. I'm not saying we're not responsible. Mm -hmm in the sense, and I understand that word is that in the true sense of being able to respond, um, mm. not being to blame or, you know, you know, for something, but actually being able to respond. So I, I find it's kind, of, it's kind of a razor's edge between like, on the one hand, accepting that we're not in full control of our experience, but on the other hand, always maintaining that ability to respond uh, in an appropriate way. And I, I I think psychedelics offer a lot of potential there. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, I share the same sentiment, right? That we are inheritors to uh, things that we are not entirely, well, we're not in control of, but it is, uh, we do have the opportunity to um, respond to it in a way that can be better for ourselves and for our community and the people around us. Great. So I want to ask one more question just to, in the general world of psychedelics. And mm. I want to move on, talk about fluence and what you're up to, because as, as you may know, you, I've trained clinicians and healthcare practitioners for um, six years now. And then more recently we had a health coach training program. And so this is obviously a, a big area of interest to me. And we have a lot of practitioners in the audience that I'm, I, I'm sure will be interested to hear about what you do. Uh, so we've talked mostly about, MDMA, a little bit about psilocybin. Ketamine is another uh, substance that's, that's, I think, seen a lot of use, particularly for depression. I'm just curious uh, if there are any new, you know, newer substances or older substances that are being rehabilitated that might be less familiar to people that you feel like are on sort of the next wave of exploration. It might be something that people see used in 10 years, five years time, whatever it is. Yeah. So I think maybe one way to split that up is uh, sometimes people use the term like first generation and second generation psychedelics. Um, so maybe the first generation are more of the naturally occurring ones, although um, MDMA is not naturally occurring, but we'll probably go into that box. So some of the lesser known ones, for example, 5-MeO-DMT, that is a... Um, compound that uh, I'm working with or Fluence is working with a company called uh, Beckley SciTech and they will be launching phase two studies to treat treatment resistant depression um, as well as some other indications. Uh, so that's one that's sort of being revitalized if you will and there are also other uh, organizations that are looking at that compound Another and, one is and very yeah. interesting and different mm -hmm. than the very yeah. fast act, you know, comes yes. on quickly, lasts for a much shorter time and ends more quickly and doesn't have as much of an extended kind of effect than psilocybin and MDMA and, and especially LSD, which has a much longer uh, time frame associated with it. Right. The, the acute kind of um, duration. So the immediate, I don't like the word intoxication, but sort of the, the duration of the the drug effect is uh, very short, particularly compared to LSD, which you know has important implications for kind of mixing questions here, but um, important implications for how uh, the treatment is disseminated and then how it's accessed. Uh, one of the largest costs that's associated with psychedelic therapy is the time of the therapist. So if you have a therapist, two therapists or one therapist present for an eight hour psychotherapy session with psilocybin, that is, has a different cost than say 5-MeO-DMT, which might be 45 minutes or two hours. So there's an upside to that. The question is, does it work as well? And, and we, we don't know, uh, know yet. Another sort of 
uh, cactus. <laughs> so mm -hmm. uh, peyote or uh, mescaline is being studied or will be studied soon. Uh, there are a, a number of other compounds, but I'll also mention, and I can't really speak to the exact ones um, because I'm either un, either under NDA or I don't right. know what they are. <laughs> um, but those are the second generation psychedelics, right? And that's where companies are looking to either alter an existing molecule or create a new uh, molecule to see whether the benefits can be maintained with maybe shortening the duration of the effect or uh, having a different kind of effect that could be helpful for, um, for treatment. The, the big attention though is really towards the kind of the accessibility question, right? Like how can we increase the safety of these compounds? Um, can we make it something that fits into a shorter period of time um, so that it could be affordable? And then there's also pushback on that topic, right? Some people might say, well, you, you need the six hours, that that's part of the process. Mm -hmm. And all of these are really, really exciting empirical questions. That's what my PhD mentor would always say. That's an empirical question, <laughs> meaning right. we can do the In study words, and see what- Check it out. Check yeah. it out. Yeah. See what happens. Yeah. yeah. People sometimes don't have an appreciation for the very trial and error nature of science, that that is part of the scientific process to come up with a, I mean, that's fundamentally what science is, right? Come up, you make a guess and you check it out that in lay person's terms. So yeah. I have my own experience and thoughts about, you know, what, which psychedelic or substance is, you know, I might consider depending on what I'm currently exploring or interested in or what kind of uh, effect that I feel like I'm looking for, uh, what, what's going on in my life, et cetera. From a, a therapeutic perspective, how do you think about the different, let's just say the three most common ones, mm. if these are the most common ones that you're working with, um, MDMA, psilocybin, and ketamine. Mm -hmm. When somebody comes to you, or as part of a study or something like that, um, when are you going to when are you going to think about one of those versus the other? Like, where where do you see each one having the greatest application and benefit? Yeah, yeah, great question. Somebody once told me, and I agree that MDMA is really a great uh, drug for PTSD because of what it does, and I think it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of the biological effects and the creation of safety. Um, the person who rediscovered um, DMA in the 1970s, Sasha Shulgin, used to refer to it as a easily controllable state of consciousness. And you had mentioned control earlier, which is a really important theme when it comes to, to these experiences. <laughs> you know, we know that, um, I'm sorry, I'm going on a tangent here a little bit, but we know that just in your ordinary state of consciousness, try to control your experience. I mean, you're not going to have a good time. It's very hard to control your experience. And Don't now think add... about an elephant. Don't think yeah, right. about an elephant, <laughs> right. right? Right. So now add a psychedelic or something, a, a compound that kind of changes your state of consciousness. It can get that, that, when you try to control your experience, the kind of anxiety or tension that's created there can get amplified. And so what's nice about MDMA is that when you have somebody who's gone through something very traumatic, there's a way, as Sasha had said, um, that the state that the MDMA induces is one where a person's state of mind can more easily kind of adapt to what is happening in the present moment. It kind of facilitates almost a kind of acceptance of what's happening in a sense of safety. We don't see that really in say psilocybin, right? And so, although there are studies to be done on psilocybin for PTSD, one differentiator from psilocybin and MDMA is um, it's something referred to as the mystical experience. And we have quantifiable uh, data from empirical studies that demonstrate that um, there's a greater likelihood of having a mystical experience with psilocybin than with MDMA. I'm also somewhat critical of this construct. That's a, that's a <laughs> tangent, but let's just yeah. go with it for a while. Yeah. Um, that there's something about having a mystical experience that is helpful for people. The concept of self-transcendence or unity with all things. And perhaps there, that kind of slightly more strong spiritual emphasis or experience with psilocybin, maybe that's potentially more helpful when it comes to, say, addictive disorders, where there is um, 
often such a loss of meaning in life or such disconnection in people's lives that the sort of um, mystical transcendent experience of connection is reparative for somebody. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes to ketamine, you know, in terms of kind of, I'm not a doctor, but a, a medical doctor, but I should say that in terms of um, physiological safety, uh, I believe you would kind of rank it as ketamine, ketamine being the most safe, then psilocybin, then MDMA. MDMA is an amphetamine. So yeah. there's some, it's a stimulant. There's some more risks associated with that. I'm not sure psilocybin versus ketamine in terms of which one is more physiologically safe, but we know that ketamine is used um, in emergency rooms. It does not have a lot of um, medications that interact with it. It's given to children um, in order because it doesn't suppress breathing uh, during certain su surgeries and procedures. So um, ketamine is one where I would think, okay, um, it could be useful depending on the, the health of the person. It's more safe. But also we have really solid evidence that it's so really, really helpful for people who are really acutely and intensely suicidal. Yeah. It seems pretty clear that um, if that's something that somebody's really struggling with, that the depression is that intense, that ketamine would be a, a good choice. Hmm. Yeah, that's definitely, I've seen when I said earlier in the show, like near miraculous um, responses uh, in part and thinking of people with suicidal ideation, severe depression, having a single ketamine treatment and being almost feeling almost completely normal the next day. And yeah. I don't know of any other treatment for depression and suicidal ideation that has e even that potential. So it's, it's a pretty exciting application. You know, I mean, going back to the differences between these three substances is there's obviously like the biochemical me mechanistic differences that we don't even fully understand now. Um, but I appreciate the distinctions you were making with MDMA and, and then something like psilocybin. We didn't mention LSD, mm. the mescaline. The biggest difference from my perspective there is is the alteration of perspective or right. consciousness you know with with mdma it's a lot more about compassion empathy um, being able to put myself in someone else's shoes mm -hmm. and really almost kind of fully inhabit that experience see things from that perspective and and really kind of drop a lot of the defenses the habitual kind of ways that uh, we interact with one another and and just settle into our heart and and mm -hmm. really be in that place of of unconditional love and undefended love. Yeah, and that's a incredibly <laughs> precious <laughs> yeah. thing to be able to experience and offer, and that that can change us in fundamental ways. But there aren't typically visuals associated mm -hmm. with MDMA. You know. Um, Hallucin uh, hallucination or, or even really shifts in perception. Whereas with these other substances, you know, psil psilocybin, mushrooms, um, LSD, mescaline, DMT, to varying degrees, depending on the dose and depending on how they affect someone, there can be profound changes in our experience of, of physical reality <laughs> around That's us. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think going back to something you said earlier, it creates a sense of not only impermanence, but also that our perception of the world around us is limited by our sense organs mm -hmm. and that what we see every day is not the only thing that's there. <laughs> and, yeah. and that that's like opens up a whole range of possibility and, and questions and inquiry and I think just wonder and awe at like what it is to be human and live in this incredible world and, and how little of it we actually can perceive, how little of reality we can actually perceive. Yeah, I'd love to riff on that a little bit. Um, so Aldous Huxley had this uh, hypothesis of the, the brain or mind as being a, a, a filter. Um, and we know this from just perception, just very basic perception that um, we filter out information uh, because if we were really to perceive everything that was coming at us at once and also not just externally but also internally from what's, what's in it, it would just be we wouldn't be able to to exist it would be just overwhelming we wouldn't be able to navigate the world and so um, Aldous Huxley's hypothesis was that perhaps what psychedelics do 
is inhibit the amount of um, filtration. In other words, open up the aperture, if you will, of experience or open up the, um, the valve so that more water is flowing through the, um, uh, through the, the pipe or faucet so that there's more that's accessible. And that's not just a biological limitation as it is with perception, but um, I would say, and others have said before me, that this is also culturally um, bound. So what we value uh, as important, uh, we may be more likely to, to be aware of in those things that we culturally value less. Um, there's a phenomenon, I'm just thinking now, with smoking, pe people who smoke, uh, there's something called attentional bias, where they're more likely to say notice um, cigarette butts on the ground, or if you're using alcohol, then perhaps you're more likely to notice the, the liquor store on the corner. And so it's just an example of how um, different people notice different things. And when a person has this temporary experience of being on a psychedelic, they can reorient or have a, a re-relate to again, not just um, the things that they val put into a different value hierarchy, um, but also become aware of things, aspects of their experience or past that they previously neglected, but they can now um, be aware of. And I find that that may be a place where people can access some insight into, into themselves and how they might want to be different <laughs> uh, moving forward after the experience. Yeah, that the, the self-concept is not cemented in that it's labile and we actually can we recreate it every moment with choices that we make and we can make different choices that will lead to a different way of experiencing ourselves so i love that and that's maybe a good uh way to shift gears here i, I want to hear a little bit more about fluence and and what you're doing you know we've sort of been talking i think about various aspects of why it's so important to train clinicians and people who are going to be using these substances in a therapeutic context with individuals because it's not the same as just learning about the effects of a of, of a pharmaceutical drug writing a prescription and sending someone to a pharmacy it's a fundamentally different context and interaction so yeah tell us a little bit about uh, what you're doing with fluence to address that yeah sure so fluence is a essentially a training or psychedelic education company. And we focus on primarily training licensed mental health professionals, but a large portion, majority of our um, content and classes can be taken by uh, really anybody. And the Florence was really born out of an observation, which was that uh, people are having psychedelic experiences all the time. Roughly 10% of the US population has had a psychedelic experience at some point in their life, and that wow, those, I didn't yeah. realize the number was that high. Yeah, and those and those data are from uh, a paper published in two thousand and I think twelve, based off of data from two thousand ten. So it's possible that the um, lifetime prevalence might be even higher, yeah. um, but at least you know ten percent is a safe guess. Yet, uh, how many clinicians are uh, aware of psychedelics and what those experiences um, entail? Uh, in fact, I would, I would say, I think this is changing, but um, probably still today, people are not only are, are they not informed about psychedelics, they're misinformed about them. I mean, partly due to uh, the drug war or just them kind of being like a, a, an oddball drug. Like if you go through mental health training, you're going to, and if you choose to specialize in substance use uh, treatment or addiction you're very unlikely to encounter the topic of psychedelics because they don't have the typical um, kind of pattern of uh, habitual use. They tend to usually not be problematic, although they can be. And so a, a, a mental health professional is just not going to have any clue about them unless they've been interested in them themselves. And so we created Fluence to address that problem. We wanted people who in the community, in the world who have psychedelic experiences, if they turn to a therapist to have some sense of confidence or a pathway to be able to work with somebody who's going to understand their wish to have a psychedelic experience or anxiety that might be coming from a past ex psychedelic experience or uh, somebody who might be just wanting to continue to reap the benefits of psychedelics, 
And so we created this training program. And when that was up and running, we had another observation, which is that there are all these emerging psychedelic pharmaceutical companies. This is around 2019, 2020. And they have an expertise in how to take a drug through the FDA process and potentially turn it into a medicine. So they have pharma expertise, they have an expertise in a molecule, but they know nothing about psychotherapy because historically, uh, it, you know, it is the FDA, it is the Food and Drug Administration, it is not the psychotherapy you know, uh, administration. So what we're doing is we are working with these drug companies to create a psychotherapy manual to essentially make sure that um, psychotherapy and good psychotherapy is part of the treatment process for these, uh, these molecules. And so those are the sort of the two sides of our business. One is training clinicians in the community, and the other one is working with what we call our enterprise clients or drug companies that are looking to uh, take their drug through this process and eventually go to market. Mm, great. So, so, you know, part of my original training was as, a, as an herbalist, and I have an appreciation for the complexity of plant compounds and the fact that as far as we've come in, in our own kind of capacity for molecular analysis and looking at individual constituent compounds and what impacts they have, I don't think we're even close to understanding the synergy of how compounds interrelate within a whole plant, you know, and uh, there's a real bias in the botanical medicine community to use whole plants for that reason, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. we, we just don't know what if we, you know, the, the, the more kind of allopathic concept is to take out an active ingredient and then amplify that. And in doing so, we've caught we can uh, that's not without risk, um, right. we can we can cause problems. So I'm wondering if you have any similar concerns as the pharmaceutical industry starts to get interested in this field where that same kind of phenomenon is going to happen. There'll be a few studies published on a plant medicine, a certain compound will be identified as potentially one of the main psychoactive compounds. And then all of a sudden there'll be a drug with that compound, but it won't have the same impact that the full plant medicine had. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so there's a lot to, to say here. One thing it's important to just remind your listeners that when we talk about uh, the research process and the FDA, we're really talking about single molecules. Yeah. And so uh, we're not using fungi, like we're using psilocybin, uh, synthetic psilocybin. And there are, but there are companies out there who are looking to more closely examine all the different uh, compounds that are in the, the mushroom to mm -hmm. see if there is some sort of um, a synergistic effect between what's what's in them. Um, this also poses a challenge for, say, ayahuasca, right, yeah. which is uh, a combination of different plants, and the, that will not likely not be approved. It's, it's very okay, difficult studied. to study that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I understand. Yeah. On the other hand, the need to isolate variables in a research study, I I, I get that. I just it's just a I don't know that there's an easy solution to this uh, quandary. I think yeah. it's just something we're going to have to work with uh, over a long period of time. Well, an interesting. Um, I mean, this is, poses another kind of series of challenges, but um, we could look at Oregon, who has recently um, legalized psilocybin therapy. So it's not yet accessible. Uh, all the kind of regulatory pieces are being put into place, but uh, the goal is for 2023 for there to be a legalized psilocybin therapy. And um, there there'll, there'll be full fungi you know, use. <laughs> um, so it's not to say that they're um, that this won't necessarily be accessible, but again, you have to be careful that it's not it's not gone through kind of the federal regulatory process. Um, the question of you know I think what you were also alluding to is say something like opioids or opium becoming uh, amplified uh, to you know we've seen heroin to, to fentanyl, so these different analogs or the coca leaf and cocaine. So uh, it's an interesting question whether we will see. Um, like these molecules being taken from plants and then modified in such a way to increase the, the, the potency, the intensity. My feeling is that that is not, um, 
I somehow feel like that's going not to be such of a, a risk because the desired effect or the way that these compounds work isn't through intensifying the experience of it or or the potency. It's yeah, much it's more. It's not always more is better. That's uh, right. Yeah, there's a dose, and and of course, pharmaceutical companies are familiar with that concept. There's a there's a, you know often a U-shaped curve. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the efficacy of these substances. So that, may, that makes sense. Um, I'm still curious about whether there are effects. I mean, just speaking from personal experience, a uh, certain type of mushroom has a slightly different impact and feeling and experience for me than when I take a different type of mushroom. And I, I imagine that's lost when you're taking synthetic psilocybin. And not that that is any kind of deal breaker, or, you know, a reason not to pursue this, but it's it's just worth noting and, and yeah. pointing out. So, all right, I, this could go on and I would definitely <laughs> love to have you back because this is a, I'm really fascinated as you can probably gather in this topic and, and love talking about it. Um, so thank you so much for joining me on this show, uh, Ingmar, and where can people find out more about Fluence and the work you're doing? So the best place to uh, learn about Fluence is at fluencetraining.com. Uh, and we also have a contact page there if you want to reach out uh, and ask me questions. Uh, I'd be delighted to hear from you. Great. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Hope you enjoyed this show. Keep sending your questions in to chriscresser.com slash podcast question. We'll see you next time. When I find a company that I love and I think you'll love, I do my best to support it and help it grow. Sometimes that means just getting the word out through my podcast, emails, and social media channels. And other times that means investing in the company or joining their advisory board. If you're hearing this message, it means that I'm either an investor or advisory board member of a company that is mentioned in this podcast episode. I only invest in or advise companies with a mission and products that I truly believe in. And I hope you benefit from learning more about them and how their products can improve your life. That's the end of this episode of Revolution Health Radio. If you appreciate the show and want to help me create a healthier and happier world, please head over to iTunes and leave us a review. They really do make a difference. If you'd like to ask a question for me to answer on a future episode, you can do that at chriscresser.com slash podcast question. You can also leave a suggestion for someone you'd like me to interview there. If you're on social media, you can follow me at twitter.com slash chriscresser or facebook.com slash chriscresserlac. I post a lot of articles and research that I do throughout the week there that never makes it to the blog or podcast, so it's a great way to stay abreast of the latest developments. Thanks so much for listening. Talk to you next time.